So. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of the Spokane area, welcome to our 2022 primary election candidate forum, featuring candidates for Spokane County Court District Court Judge 3, who will be elected county, by voters countywide. I am Ann Murphy, your moderator, and Mike Bell of the League is our timer. Election day for the 2022 general election is Tuesday, November 8th. Ballots will be mailed to all registered voters beginning October 19th, and the return ballot must be postmarked or deposited in conveniently located ballot boxes no later than 8 p.m. on Election Day, November 8th. This forum can be seen as an equivalent to a job interview as you, the voter, learn more about the candidates seeking to hold office, and you, the voters, are the ones who will determine by your vote and making your informed decision for hiring your representation when you mark your ballot. Citizens can register to vote by mail or online at votewa.gov by October 31, 2022, or in person on election day at the Spokane County Elections Office and Center Place in Spokane Valley. For other questions about casting your ballot or information about the candidates, contact the Spokane County Elections Office. 509-477-2320, or visit their website, spokanecounty.org elections, or on the League of Women Voters online voters guide, vote411.org. I'll be asking the candidates questions that have been formulated by the League's Voter Services Committee, and will ask as many questions as time allows. Before the questions begin, the candidates will have up to 30 seconds to introduce themselves and tell you, the voters, why they are running. They will have up to one minute to answer each question with additional time for rebuttal or follow-up question as appropriate. And each candidate will have the opportunity for a 30-second closing statement. Our first speaker will alternate with each question. And now to meet the candidates. They are Eric Duema and Jenny Zappone. So starting with you, Mr. Duema, you will have 30 seconds to tell us why you're running for district court judge. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for having us today. I, I see the, uh, the arena's kind of cleared out now that uh, the exciting debate uh, has ended. Uh, but uh, anyway, I'm, I'm Eric Doima. I'm the current Spokane County District Court Commissioner. Uh, I was appointed in June of 2018 into that position. Uh, prior to that, uh, I had my own uh, law practice here in Spokane County, uh, where I did a number of different types of cases. Uh, and so uh, I think 30 seconds to introduce yourself isn't a lot of time, so I think I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you, Ms. Zapone. Thank you, and thank you to the Women League of Voters. Uh, Spokane is my home. This is where I um, was born and raised, and this is where I plan to raise my three boys with my husband. Uh, for the past decade plus, I've been working in public service as a deputy prosecuting and attorney to advocate for victims of crime, to uh, advocate for community safety, and to advocate for justice. I've worked with uh, kids. I've worked in the behavioral health unit, and I've worked with the most violent offenders in Spokane County. I hope to make a difference as a district court judge. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And now we'll move into some specific questions to learn even more about you. And since quite often judges on the ballot are uh, confusing for uh, voters, and so we want to know what are the kinds of matters that will come before you on district court? We know you can't discuss specifics, but and what in your experience prepares you to handle them? And what do you see are the most important issues facing the, the public that appear before you in district court? That's a lot in there for a minute. So go forth. This is a phone. Thank you. Um, so district court is going to be um, where we have misdemeanors and gross misdemeanor crimes. And those are crimes uh, that carry a sentence of up to a year, 360, actually four days in jail. We are also dealing with small claims court and civil actions such as protection orders. I have actually uh, practiced in district court. I've done the infraction docket and tried DUI cases in district court. 
Um, I have been a deputy prosecutor for over a decade, which has prepared me well to handle the district court matters. I consider district court the front court of our criminal justice system, um, meaning that all walks of all walks of life come into our uh, in the district court. All ethnicities, all socioeconomic backgrounds walk into this courtroom. Um, so we are seeing everybody. With my experience handling behavioral health disorders, children, and violent offenders, I bring a per perspective to district court that is currently necessary. Okay, thank you. Mr. Duema. Yeah, Ms. Sapone is exactly right. Uh, we're a court of limited jurisdiction. We handle misdemeanors, gross misdemeanors. We also handle civil cases up to $100,000, small claims cases, infractions cases, and a lot of protection order cases. Uh, we do some impounds uh, for the city and for the county. Uh, I think the, the one question was, what are the important cases that uh, we see? Uh, and again, Ms. Sapone is exactly right. Uh, we're kind of the front line. I think uh, a lot of folks only interaction with the court system in Spokane County is oftentimes in district court. Sometimes it's for very minor things like speeding tickets and things like that. Uh, we do see a lot of small claims cases and then obviously a lot of uh, misdemeanor and gross misdemeanors. Uh, the most serious of those that we see are uh, DUI cases or driving under the influence cases and our domestic violence cases. We have a lot of domestic violence assault cases. Uh, I guess what I'd call vandalism, we call it malicious mischief uh, in, Spo or in, in uh, Washington State. Uh, and those are the most serious cases. We also have a bunch of specialty courts. We have a mental health court. It's a joint court. Uh, we have a, a DUI therapeutic court and a vet's court. Okay, thank you. And we're going to get into those a little bit later too. But before we move down there, what traits do you possess that will make you a good judge? Mr. Duema. Uh, I, I think it, it's always hard to answer that question. I'm not very good at uh, telling you why I'm, I'm good at something. Uh, and so I'm a little out of my element, but uh, I think anybody that's appeared in front of me over the last eight years or so uh, will tell you that I have a pretty even keel. Uh, I have, a, 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 I guess, a calm temperament. Uh, I, I always tell a, a kind of a half, a half joke when people ask me why I wanna be a judge. Uh, and that joke is uh, I wasn't a very good lawyer. And, and what I mean by that is I always wanted to come to the right answer. And so uh, whatever my client's position was, uh, always wasn't necessarily as important to me as maybe it should have been because I, I wanted the right answer to be found no matter what the case was and no matter what side I was on. And so I, I kind of made the decision that maybe I should uh, try to wear the robe at some point. Uh, I started doing that back in January of 2014 uh, as a, a pro tem judge for Ponderay County District Court. Uh, and I've covered in, geez, I think eight different jurisdictions in Eastern Washington as judge or commissioner uh, be, before being appointed to uh, the district court here. Okay, we end it there. And Ms. Zapone. So some of the characteristics and traits that I believe I have that would make me a good district court judge is I do have an even temperament. I think that is very important when you're dealing with the public, when you're dealing with very contested issues, uh, tempers are hot. Um, I also have a very strong worth, work ethic and this was driven into me as a young child. I was uh, trying to make the United States ski team. I have always been working my hardest to do my best in every aspect of my career. I have been working hard every day for the community of Spokane as an advocate um, for cr victims of crime and for public safety. Every day I have given 110% to the citizens of Spokane and our community. So I think hard work is probably one of my best traits that I have. I'm also fair. I have diverse bipartisan support. I have defense attorney support, which says a lot coming as a prosecutor um, into becoming a judge. I have a commitment, if I do become a judge, to neutrality. Okay. Thank you. So we'll move into talking about the role. What role should a judge play in advocating access to justice? And what have you done in your career to enhance access to justice? And this may just be enhancing on some things you've said already, but Ms. Zapone? So I do believe that judges are leaders in our community and judges should and can be a catalyst for coordinating service for both offenders and for victims. And in, in order to do that, we need to be outreaching to different groups in the community, such as MIA, which uh, serves victims of sexual assault and domestic violence. I've also reached out to the Fatherhood Initiative Projects that helps fathers become uh, more involved in children's lives. 
we also need to work with these groups to provide better access to justice. What does that mean? How easy is it for them to get to court? Can we move court hours so that people aren't missing work? Can we serve different, uh, serve the Valley of Spokane in better ways? So in, if they have language barriers, are we working to accommodate those in court and through the court building itself so people know how to get there and where to go? So working with communities is vital to ensuring access to justice. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Duema. Yeah, the, we've, we've learned a lot because of uh, some things that were forced upon us. Uh, COVID was one, obviously. Uh, we, we used to have very limited uh, remote access to courts. Uh, sometimes we would allow people to appear by phone. It was always very difficult. Uh, we've been kind of forced to evolve faster than we probably, well, I know that we would have uh, without, without that uh, kind of push. And so we have a lot of remote hearings that uh, we've learned a lot about it. The, the one thing I'd like to, to kind of expand on is uh, access to justice can kind of be a fine line when you're sitting on the bench uh, because we have, we have a, an ethical obligation to remain neutral and unbiased, and, but you want to help folks when they're in front of you. And so sometimes it's, it's hard that uh, you can't answer questions. I, I, I find myself saying I can't give legal advice uh, many times during, th throughout the day. But what I wanted to say was setting expectations at the beginning of the hearing is very, very important. It doesn't matter if the person is English as a second language or, or, or not. Uh, it's, uh, it's very important just to set expectations. Okay. Thank you. And that segues into where we're going because this, what you were just saying, brings up the um, issues that can perceived or otherwise around racial equi equity problems that um, may exist in Spokane and how will you use your judge position to help mitigate racial equity um, issues? Mr. Duema? That, that's that's a, a tough question to answer in one minute. Uh, I know. <laughs> but, uh, but what I will say is uh, we see folks from all different walks of life in district court, as I think both of us pointed out a little while ago. Uh, what I can tell you is I've spent my in entire legal career uh, representing folks from diverse backgrounds. Uh, I started out in the public defender's office, uh, and then when I had my own practice here in uh, Spokane, I worked for both uh, the Kalispell tribe and the Spokane tribe, learning a lot about their culture. I, every Thursday afternoon, I would drive out to Welpinit uh, and appear in district, or I'm, I'd say almost said district court, in tribal court, uh, out in Welpinit. Uh, and, and all I can do is take each individual case as it comes before me. Uh, it doesn't matter who the litigants are, who the parties are, who the defendant is, uh, who the petitioner is. Uh, I just have to take the case, uh, learn about the facts of the case, apply that to the law, and follow the law where it takes me. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Zappone? Thank you. And um, I do believe that we need to follow the law and apply the law to the facts, regardless of whom is in front of us. Um, but one of the ways that we can work to fight racial in inequity is to, to, we have tools as a judge. We need to make sure that the law is being filed with a jury selection. Um, that can be done through GR 37 uh, and Batson. These are rules that when people, attorneys are picking juries, everybody deserves a fair trial. That's one way we can learn and make sure we're following the law and doing it appropriately and making sure that everybody has a right to a fair trial. Um, again, I believe it is our duty as leaders in this community to be outreaching outside of the courtroom to make sure that we are doing everything in our power to make sure our system um, is working the way that it should and um, we are actually taking action to be anti-racist. We need to do that outside of our out of the courtroom, and we, that I'm going to stop right there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. What I want to talk about now are uh, the therapeutic courts as an alternative to incarceration, and I know that we have several here in Spokane, and we're just wondering how many individuals are served by that. How many people cannot be accommodated, uh, and the length of the programs and what you see as the success rates for the current therapeutic courts. And we'll start with you, Ms. Zappone. Thank you. So in district court, we do have a veterans court. We have an intensive supervision therapeutic court. We, um, we have a mental health court. Hopefully we can establish a domestic violence court. Um, I do think a DV uh, court is necessary um, because we're hoping to prevent people from moving on to more serious, uh, serious offenses. Therapeutic courts 
um, are invaluable if it is with the right person. And we need to be looking at if the person is appropriate for therapeutic courts. And we need to be looking at criminal history. We need to be looking at um, restitution for the victim. We need to be inquiring of the victim um, what they wish to do as well. It's also defendants um, have... um, it's voluntary, so whether or not defendants want to do it. There are some crimes that we can't allow in, and I think that needs to be expanded. I've tried as a prosecutor to try to get a second-degree assault reduced down to uh, mental health court and district court, and I was not allowed to do that. And I think in these situations, we should be doing those more of those facts. Okay, we'll talk more about that in the next question. Mr. Duema. Thank you. So uh, Ms. Lapone's exactly right. Uh, we have... Uh, three, I call them specialty courts in, in district court. We have our, our DUI court, we call it ISTC. Uh, th- that court is, is, is pretty much mandatory for folks that qualify for it. The mental health court and the vet courts are voluntary, uh, and there are disqualifiers. Um, you asked about the success rate. I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I can tell you that I, I preside over those dockets on almost a weekly basis. Uh, and it's, it's uh, it's, it's hard to put into words how encouraging it is to see people succeed in those programs. Uh, it keeps them out of, out of custody. Uh, it keeps them, well, I guess what I'll say is it provides services that most folks, folks don't get in regular probation. Um, we keep a little bit closer tabs on folks. They, they get to know the judge and the court a lot better. They get to know their probation officers a lot better. And finding housing, transportation, helping them with these, get their driver's license back. It's, it's things that don't happen on normal probation cases and it turns, it turns their lives around. Okay, and with that in mind, what are the pros and cons of developing more um, therapeutic courts and are there other, you've touched on it a bit, but what other kinds of therapeutic courts would you like to see? And we'll go with Mr. Duema first. Yeah, and, and Ms. Sapone uh, hit the nail on the head. Uh, a domestic violence uh, therapeutic court is, is, is what we're working toward. And the district court actually prior to COVID was working pretty hard toward that goal. Uh, COVID kind of uh, put through a wrench in the works and, and a lot of that planning has stalled. Uh, but the barriers obviously are cost. Uh, for example, our mental health court has its own dedicated staff, uh, and so we have salaries to pay. Uh, we need space for those folks. Uh, I think, I'm trying to think, I guess it doesn't matter. I think we have four or five dedicated staff to the mental health court. Um, and so to try to get a domestic violence court going, uh, we would have similar issues with cost. However, I, I think the domestic violence court could mirror the DUI court. Uh, and I think it would, uh, frankly, I'm shocked we don't have a DUI uh, court at this point. I, I don't know why we don't. Uh, and that would obviously be one of my priorities, uh, getting on the bench as judge instead of commissioner. I would have a little bit more pull uh, when it comes to trying to get these programs through uh, and I guess my, my time's up. Okay, thank you. Ms. Zappone. Thank you. And, um, you know, talking with the DV Coalition, there are, they're actively working with the prosecutor's office, with the courts, to establish the domestic violence um, therapeutic court and district court. And like I said, if we need to establish this court um, in uh, district court so that they're not escalating their behavior to felony so that they can obtain the necessary treatment and um, anger uh, control they need to uh, successfully uh, be members of our community. Now, talking about probation, you know, probation, well, we would need probation. We would need extra people. Right now, uh, it's difficult to hire people. So we're, we're low on staff with probation. Um, so we need resources and obviously money um, and that monitoring. Um, but I also think it would be really interesting if we could try to work towards a uh, community court for Spokane Valley. Um, we serve Spokane Valley. We need to be um, helping Spokane Valley and, and paying more attention to them as well. Okay, thank you. So moving uh, all these things, how do you plan for an effective management of the docket in your court if you are successful? Ms. Zappone? Thank you. And so what you're going to get in district court is high volume a lot of cases, a lot of defense attorneys, um, a couple prosecutors in your court. It is a fa- fast pace, but you don't want to lose um, you don't want to lose integrity of the cases for efficiency at the same time. But there are ways to 
things up. There are ways to take care of cases that uh, are quickly resolved versus cases that may take longer. I know that Spokane City Municipal Court has uh, adopted a differentiated case management system, which means that they're looking at cases that may take longer and adjusting schedules for that. And cases that are going to be resolved quickly, those are on a so you're reducing the amount of hearings uh, for different types of cases. And this is all at the defense and um, uh, request and their own scheduling. So you're not forcing this on anybody. But it, I've heard that it's working great. But it's, you have to, as a supervisor, I manage a lot of people. And that's multitasking is key. Okay, thank you. Mr. Duema. Yeah, so un unfortunately, uh, Ms. Sapone nor I will most likely be on a criminal docket as, as one of the new judges. Uh, we'll most likely be on a civil docket at least for a couple of years. Uh, and so the docket assignments in the civil department are, are very different than the docket assignments in the criminal department. Uh, but, I, but I'll talk a little bit about the criminal cases because I think that's probably what most people are interested in. And uh, we see a lot of cases get continued over and over and over again. And it, it's frustrating for the court, it's frustrating for uh, victims, it's frustrating for defendants, it's frustrating for attorneys. And so uh, we're always talking in judges' meetings about what to do about these continuance requests, and there's never good answers. But uh, if I was assigned to a criminal case, that, or a criminal docket, I'm sorry, uh, that would certainly be one of my priorities is to try to get a handle on these continuances and make sure that these cases are resolved in a, in a timely fashion. The civil cases are a little bit different because the, the attorneys and the parties have much more control over what happens with the case. Uh, the criminal cases, the court can kind of keep their thumb on a little bit better. Okay, so I want uh, our last question before we go to your closing. What do you see are the most important issues that are facing the public, the, uh, the members that appear, people that appear before you in court, and how, would, how do you work to uh, help deal with those issues? Mr. Duema? Uh, I think I'll, I'll kind of pick, pick a topic here. Um, Great. I think uh, those of us that practice law, either attorneys uh, or uh, judges or commissioners or whatever you want to say, uh, there's been a big shift in the law with regard to protection orders. And we were at a forum last week and we talked a lot about protection orders. Uh, but I think that's one area that's been extremely frustrating for folks to get into court. Um, and things have changed a lot uh, because of COVID, because of recent law changes that's made it easier for folks to get into court to seek a protection order. Um, the Superior Court and the District Court kind of have juris dual jurisdiction over things. It depends on the type of protection order. Uh, but uh, what I'm getting at is uh, it's a little bit easier to file in District Court now because people can can basically file a, p a protection order petition 24 seven through email. Uh, Superior Court's lagging a little bit behind on that. And I think it's made it a little bit easier. Uh, sometimes folks are scared to file for protection orders because they have to go to court. It can be embarrassing. It can be, they can have transportation issues, things like that. Okay, Got it. thank you. Ms. Ms. Zappone. The number one thing that I have heard from the whole campaign is community safety. People are frustrated that, that uh, defendants um, are getting released, committing new crimes, getting sentenced, getting back out again, and they're seeing it the same people over and over again. They find that there's no respect for the law, there's no respect for our community. That is the number one issue that I have heard from members of our community. With my experience as a deputy prosecuting attorney for over a decade, working as a advocate for community safety and ultimately justice. I've worked with those with behavioral health issues and with children and violent offenders. With that perspective, I believe I can hold people accountable while uh, following the law. I have that perspective going in, and I, I believe that's the number one issue that is affecting Spokane at this time. Okay, thank you. We'll now go to your closing statements. You'll ha each have 30 seconds to um, cap this event. So, Ms. Zappone. Thank you so much for having me. It means a lot to me. Just like this community means everything to me. Again, I was born and raised here. This is my home, and this is where I'm raising my three boys with my husband. I have, for the last decade plus, been working as a to advocate for our community. I will, should I be elected, bring an unwaver unwavering commitment to justice. Moreover, I will recognize the intrinsic dignity of each person that comes before me. Thank you. Mr. Duema. Thank you. Uh, again, thank you for having us. Uh, I, I really do enjoy these forums. Uh, I, think, I, think, uh, I think we 
got along a little better than the, the, the two in front before us. Uh, that was quite entertaining. But uh, I, again, I just want to say thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm the district court commissioner. Uh, I, I guess I can say I, I feel like district court is my home. Uh, I, I really enjoy going to court every day. I, I love talking about court. That's why I like coming to these things. Uh, and I'd like to continue to serve Spokane County uh, on the district court as judge. Okay, thank you very much. This includes, concludes our 2022 general election candidate forum featuring candidates for the Spokane County District Court Judge 3. And they are Eric Duema and Jenny Sapone. And so reminders to you as the voters, be sure to register to vote online or by mail by October 31. Same day registration on election day can be done at the Spokane County Elections Office and center place in the Spokane Valley. Ballots will be mailed to registered voters October 19th through the 21st. Ballots must be postmarked, though no postage is necessary, or deposited in conveniently located ballot boxes and voter services centers no later than 8 p.m. on Election Day, November 8th. For locations of ballot boxes or voter service centers, information about accessible voting units or other questions about casting your ballot, go to the Spokane County Elections Office, 509-477. 2320 or check out their website spokanecounty.org slash elections. Contact information for candidates as well as a voter's guide can be found on the website of the Spokane County Elections Office. Additional information about the candidates can also be found on the League of Women Voters uh, online guide vote411.org. On behalf of the League of Women Voters, Thank you to our candidates for their participation in this forum. We hope this has given you, the voters, the information you will need to make an informed decision when marking your ballot by election day. For more information about the League of Women Voters, you can go to lwvspokane.org. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you.